was an opportunity for us to share um, amongst the group the kind of work that's going on, the kind of thinking that's going on, the purpose of this work well, um, is uh, to increase public awareness of and interest in wisdom and wisdom research. What that means is that uh, wisdom does not appear a lot in the public vernacular and public media. Um, and there isn't a lot of discourse about wisdom broadly, uh, although uh, things like intelligence and skills and so forth are things that are talked about in the educational realm. Why is wisdom important? Who cares about it? Why do we think about it? Why should we think about it? For the University of Chicago, one way of doing that is to interact better with our professional schools. Uh, the professional schools um, provide conduits for impact on society through law, medicine, business, and policy. It's an opportunity for us to uh, enrich the way that we think about wisdom research. It's also an opportunity for us to affect the way that professionals in society go out in the world and think about what they do. Perspective taking allows us to understand somebody else's mental state better that could lead to us having greater empathy for other people or to be better at solving interpersonal problems and conflicts because we're better uh, at thinking about the other person's perspective in these cases. It might allow us to better incorporate others' knowledge or opinions into our decisions if we're in charge of a group. Um, and it could just help us to communicate more effectively with one another in general. So in particular, this project I've been working on is looking at the effect of figurative language interpretation and specifically metaphor interpretation on uh, perspective taking in conversation. So we hypothesized that if figurative language enhances social reasoning, then interpreting metaphors uh, could lead to better perspective taking. And that if the mechanism for this enhancement is divergent thinking, then maybe we'll see equal benefit uh, in people who do a different divergent thinking task that doesn't necessarily involve figurative language. So our three tasks were metaphor interpretation, literal sentence interpretation, and an alternative uses task. So after our participants completed uh, one of these three tasks in phase one, then they all moved on to a tangram sorting task. Finally, after participants complete the tangram sorting task, then they uh, complete an ambiguity tolerance questionnaire. And so this is just a 22 item scale, and as the name would suggest, it's designed to assess participants' attitudes towards ambiguous situations. So some sort of interim conclusions. Uh, the participants in all three conditions seem to complete the tangram task in similar amounts of time. The alternative uses participants talk the least overall. Our metaphor participants were seeing that their directors talk the most, but the matchers talk the least. And in the literal sentence interpretation condition, um, the matchers talk the most out of any matchers. Uh, and they take the most turns. And to me, this is some preliminary evidence that uh, in this condition, maybe the matchers are asking more clarification questions. So this could be evidence that maybe the literal sentence interpretation directors aren't giving as, as good of descriptions to start out with. I just want to show you the results from our ambiguity tolerance questionnaire. Our metaphor directors have the highest ambiguity tolerance of any of our participants, whereas uh, the matchers have among the lowest. So the question that I had looking at this is why do the metaphor participants conversations uh, and ambiguity tolerance scores look so different? And one interpretation that I came up with is that perhaps our directors in the metaphor task are talking more, uh, in the metaphor interpretation condition, are talking more because we've primed this state of divergent thinking. They're thinking of all these different ways that they can uh, talk about the pictures. However, Maybe the matchers in this condition need to sort of be more focused in in order to take in all the information that the directors are giving them and synthesize it and match it up to what they're seeing on their screen. And so finally, uh, to conclude, what I hope we have here is an ecologically valid way of examining the role of figurative language interpretation on social reasoning and in particular perspective taking and conversation. But I think that starting to think about what it means to teach wisdom or teach about wisdom or understand wisdom in the professional schools, which is part of the impact on society, but also for undergraduates and for graduate students uh, and in um, uh, K through 12, 
might be something that would be worth considering. It's certainly something that um, would have an impact on society. Talking about the effects of online mindfulness training um, on wisdom in elementary school teachers. John Cabot Zinn defined mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment and non-judgmentally. Over the last decade or so, there's been a rise in the turnover rates in public school teachers um, transitioning from teaching um, out into other positions and other careers at right about the three to five year range um, due to burnout and stress. So we were hoping um, to understand if an online mindfulness uh, training could help to alleviate some of these concerns that teachers are facing. And some of the benefits um, specifically that we thought might impact some of these some components of wisdom were practicing um, letting go and decreasing rumination, applying tacit knowledge to context, um, changes in emotional intelligence, and then also compassion. So what we found is that the um, online mindfulness training did increase uh, mindfulness significantly for the group that took the mindfulness course, and then there wasn't um, a significant change in the control group. And what we have here is actually a significant decrease in the reflective dimension of wisdom score for the mindfulness group um, and no change in the control group. So what we want to take away from this is that, there, that the online mindfulness training may play a role in the reflective dimension of wisdom. Um, our teachers who had little to no experience with mindfulness were being less reflective, but then they were also being more mindful. And I think one of the important things to note is that with the, with the actual concept of mindfulness, our teachers were able to identify their feelings or their thoughts or then their sensations in their bodies, and then they were able to let go of those things and not continue to ruminate on them. But it's worth thinking about some of the things that fall in the realm of wisdom research that people may not be thinking about currently. So some aspects of, uh, of decision research or reasoning, some aspects of um, uh, studies of self-awareness. One could conceive of areas of psychology, philosophy, uh, classics and history that might be relevant to wisdom research. Tension respiration theory is the idea of soft fascination. So the kind of uh, stimulation that captures your involuntary tension should be soft in nature. And what I mean by that uh, is if you're looking at a beautiful waterfall, that's going to automatically capture your attention, but it tends not to be all-consuming. So you can look at, at this beautiful waterfall, but still think about other things. Uh, that's different than uh, watching some action movie that typically grabs your attention very harshly, but it doesn't really let it go. When we test uh, attention restoration theory, well, we did one experiment. Uh, these were on undergrads. So we had 38 undergraduates from the University of Michigan. Uh, our main measure of uh, directed attention was using a backward digit span task, so this is a very difficult task of working memory and attention. We see a significant interaction where people significantly improved in their backward digit span performance after walking in the natural environment, but not after walking in an urban environment. Uh, we found that there are no order effects, so it didn't matter if you walked in nature first, the first week or the second week, you showed this uh, this bump by walking in nature. Uh, interestingly, there was no relationship to mood, so people's mood tended to improve when they walked in nature versus the urban environment, but the mood effects didn't correlate uh, with the memory effects. We were interested in looking at how neighborhood green space uh, would impact health uh, in, a, in a big city, in this case Toronto, um, to, to try to actually quantify the extent to which uh, your proximity to green space impacts health. So in our analysis, we, we analyzed 3,200 of these neighborhoods in the city of Toronto. And we can quantify uh, the amount of green space in those neighborhoods with satellite imagery. We had this Ontario Health study, too, that had uh, res responses from 94,000 people living in the, the greater Toronto area, asking them various health-related questions. So we find in our data that a 1% increase in health perception is associated with 
10 more trees on a city block. Uh, and to get that equivalent increase uh, in health perception, you would have to give each person, live, each household in that city block $10,000 and have all those families move to a richer neighborhood by $10,000. Uh, or uh, you can make people seven years younger. Um, so then if we look at metabolic disorders, um, a 1% decrease in metabolic disorders. Uh, was associated with planting 20 more trees uh, on the street per city block. That was equivalent to increasing annual income by about $20,000 and moving to an area that's about $20,000 richer or being about one and a half years younger. That maybe interacting with nature promotes wisdom. Maybe uh, that's another benefit that you can get. Do wise people interact with nature more often? Um, and then does wisdom require directed attention? So is wisdom an effortful process that maybe uses directed attention? And maybe if you interact with nature, you re replenish directed attention resources, which then may be, you know, might let you be more wise. I think one of the issues that over the coming year would be good to be discussing would be to think about how wisdom develops, whether it's antecedents, um, some of the things that we've been talking about, epistemic humility, perseverance, reflection. The motivation for this study sort of came from uh, recent research which shows that compassion training does lead to increases in empathy and, in to, in, and to increases in compassion uh, and additionally to uh, increases in prosocial behavior. We were interested in seeing whether or not some of these effects were due to mere exposure to the language in these meditations um, as uh, sort of one component of what makes meditation effective, and also due to concerns about uh, expectancy biases in these studies, given that they are largely um, act, uh, weightless control group, uh, weightless control groups, and uh, control groups that aren't necessarily related to interpersonal relationships, such as uh, control groups that are related to, say, memory uh, training and things like that. As it relates to wisdom, compassion is uh, one of the three dimensions of wisdom, as defined by Monica Ardelt. Um, these have been defined already to some degree, compassion being sort of the uh, a behavior that is uh, positive, pro-social towards other people, often motivated by their distress. Re and as I said, recent research has uh, shown that compassion may be trainable through certain contemplative, uh, contemplative practices. So we presented compassion language like that presented in loving-kindness meditation studies. In our active control group, we took this loving-kindness meditation script and we replaced all the love and compassion language and uh, replaced that with language related to health and security. We found that uh, perspective and language interacted such that um, security language or the active control language uh, rated, these participants rated self-pain significantly higher than other pain. And the compassion language participants rated self-pain lower than other pain. So you can see this here. The, uh, the active control group essentially showed a pattern of results that was similar to previous empathy for pain studies in which people rate their own pain as higher than other people's pain. It's more salient, it's easier to imagine your own pain than it is to imagine the pain of others. Um, in the other condition, in the compassion language condition, we don't see a significant difference between self and other, which is in line with definitions of compassion, sort of blurring the line between yourself and other people. So what we see is that mere exposure to compassion-based language may lead to changes in the way individuals understand their own and others' pain. That we find increased interpersonal sensitivity to pain without explicit meditation instruction or practice underscores the ease at which compassion may be induced, as well as the importance of considerations of experiment or demands in contemplative science. These are things that in principle need to be there for wisdom to be manifest in any particular moment or decision, but they may not need to be there in all circumstances. Do they, um, are these the enabling things that allow one to benefit from certain kinds of experiences in terms of developing wisdom? How might we think about theories of wisdom in the way that we think about theories uh, in other aspects of psychology, and then how can we measure it?
Greg Poljasic. I enjoyed the wide array of ways people are looking at wisdom. So it covers a, a, a vast field, different questions. So we're all trying to attack it in certain modes. We're attacking this question, this idea, this puzzle from so many different directions that once things start falling into place, we might actually have a nice picture of what can make it up instead of just a few facets that we're just hammering over and over again. I'm Sayuri Hayakawa. I really enjoyed the nature talk. Um, Mark's thing about how it's restorative to actually have a walk in nature versus urban environment since I basically only walk in a city. So apparently there's a different world out there. <laughs> uh, my name is Serena Close. I think that I have learned that perhaps meditation may be an important role in all aspects of life. Um, especially in the things that I care about, like how we learn and how we communicate and how we attend to the thousands of things that we encounter every day, every minute, um, as we live and, and experience the world. And I think that the wisdom project and the research that's being done may actually help us to better devise uh, ways in which to learn effectively and to communicate effectively just in general, not just in the formal wisdom and meditation and mindfulness.